for victory. Grab your Bibles or your favorite device, Ephesians 4, and scroll down to flip over to the third verse, Ephesians 4, verse 3. And it reads, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Here it is, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Church, can we leap into this lesson? Can we go ahead and somebody say leap, Pastor? Say bring the book. Let's leap right on into this lesson. Before you take your seats, high five somebody and tell them I'm glad you're alive. I might not know your testimony, but I'm glad you're alive. I don't know what you've been through, but I'm glad you're alive. It's so wonderful to see your face in the place. It could have gone another way, Sister Angelica, but I'm glad you're alive to testify of his goodness. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you're alive. You may have your seats. It could have gone another way. <laughs> that accident, that sickness, it could have been me. It even should have been me. But I'm so glad that you're alive. Church, we are still, say still. We are still in our initial sermon series for the year that we started. Wait, who remembers January? Some of y'all already looking forward to New Year's 2025. You forgot we just three months removed from the last New Year. And we are still in our initial sermon series entitled One House. I can't believe it's March and we're still talking about this, but we're talking about it because God is still talking about it. God is still speaking to us regarding oneness. He's still speaking to us concerning unity. And church, hear me, it is such a relevant attribute of the church, talking about oneness, the body of believers, so much so that Jesus fervently prayed for us to be one. And, and the example that he used was, he said to the Father, Father, just the way that you and I are one, make them one with one another. Church, that's some serious unity. Because Jesus knows some special things can really happen when we all get on one accord, when we all become one. Any witnesses in the house? So Jesus prayed for this, and let me just insert this parenthetically because I know that God knows how hard it is now for us to all be together. God knows even though we are all Christians, we all go to the same church, God knows that it is still difficult to get everybody on board. Everybody stands, some people stand. Everybody claps, some people clap. Everybody say hallelujah, some people fold their arms. I ain't mad at you, because God knows. So let me just tell you what I believe. I believe God says, well, if you can just get the majority of people, I'm going to bless you anyway. Church, aren't you glad that if your neighbor don't praise him that you can't get to, oh, Lord have mercy. Aren't you glad that even though your neighbor don't praise him, it won't hold God back from blessing you? Aren't you glad that if your neighbor don't worship, it don't stop God from coming in? We just need the majority of people to get on one accord. We'll pray for the rest. Look at your neighbor and say, no, don't say nothing. Somebody just say it loud. I'm going to pray for you. So I believe the Lord knows how hard it is to get everybody on one accord like they were on that special day of Pentecost. But if we could just get the majority of people, the majority, God says, I got to go see about my people. Hands up raised, people at the altar crying unto me. There's some hungry people in there. Some people are hungry, just like in your house. It's time to eat. I'm not hungry. Let me get back to my script. So Jesus prayed for us to all be one with another. Then Paul comes on the scene and picks it up. He takes the mantle, picks up the teaching and the preaching about, guess what? Oneness and unity. So in our text, Paul encouraged the believers to keep 
the unity. The Bible, though the translations say maintain the unity or preserve or fight for the unity. Here's what Paul said. There is but one Lord, one faith, and here it is, our title for today, one baptism. Now clap your hands if you're ready to leap into the lesson. Come on, clap your hands if you're ready to leap on into it. One baptism. But church, there are, let me tell you, at least seven baptisms recorded and referenced in Scripture. And I know somebody's already saying, I thought, Pastor, you just said there's one. I did. That's why you have to hang with me. Say amen. amen. But the fact that there are seven baptisms mentioned in Scripture, that is primarily the reason for the complexity and controversy surrounding the topic. Some of you are looking at me funny, so you don't believe that baptism is a controversial topic. Let me offer this to you. Try getting in a room and invite one Baptist, one AME, one Church of God in Christ, one Assemblies of God, one Southern Baptist and Northern Baptist. I don't know how he's divided Baptist by geography. Get a Pentecostal, get a holiness in there, and get a Catholic in there. All are Christians and have them talk about baptism. Church, let me tell you something. Before they get done with that discussion, somebody's going to tell another Christian, you ain't even saved. One Christian will tell another Christian, you going to hell because you didn't do it like I did it. You didn't do it like my grand. Who am I talking to in here? You get him in the room and tell me how much unity you're going to have over one word. Baptism. So, church, will you allow me to teach it on this morning? Come on, I need to know if I can bring the book on this morning. Note takers, I need you to be ready to go. Note takers, let's go. There are seven baptisms, but allow me to hit just three on this morning. One, baptism until the remission of sins. This is the baptism unto repentance and the remission of sins. Number one. Number two, the baptism into the body of Christ. Note takers, you getting this? Note takers, you getting this? Number three, water baptism. We just observed water baptism on yesterday. But church, hear me, that's three of the seven, and they're all different. Can I teach it, church? Okay, so we know, most of us, that the Bible is divided into two testaments. Say Old Testament and New Testament. That's not new information, but church, when you study and get a deeper revelation, the revelation is that there's no division between the testaments. But there is a transition between, watch this word, Old Covenant and New Covenant. Don't miss this now because the word covenant means arrangement or agreement. Uh, when you enter into a covenant, uh, enter to a marriage with someone, you now have an arrangement. You now have an agreement. Somebody say amen. amen. So God had an arrangement with his people under the old covenant. He issued or entered into that covenant with the man named Abraham. And that old covenant was captured in the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. Then he established a new arrangement or a new covenant with the seed of that same man, Abraham. Somebody say, that's me. You're not even a Jew. Say, that's me. And that covenant is captured in the New Testament. So, baptism under the old covenant, watch this, was unto repentance and the remission of sins. The old covenant baptism was unto repentance and the remission of sins. And God used this special man named John the Baptist. That's why they called him John the Baptist, because he baptized. He was the last prophet to facilitate the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. John the Baptist. The Bible says that he was the last Old Testament prophet. And I got some scholars in here that says, no, because after I turned from Malachi over to Matthew, we started talking about John. John is not an Old Testament prophet. Oh, yes, he is. Luke chapter 16, verse 16 says, the law and the prophets were until John. So Jesus uh, used him, God used him to be this transformative transition prophet between the old covenant and the new covenant. Are we with it today? Are you hearing this today? 
So in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, here it is, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent. That word means change. It does not mean ask God for forgiveness of sins. Repent means stop, turn around, go the other direction. It means change. He says, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven. I got to stop there. This is the teaching on today. The kingdom of heaven is not heaven. The kingdom of heaven is God's system or the heavenly system. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first God's system. Seek ye first God's way of doing things, not the world's way of doing things. So John says, listen, things are about to change. I know how you've been operating before, but repent. Stop where you are. Turn around. The kingdom of heaven, a new system that is at hand. Now, once you give God a hand for the revelation. <laughs> Verse five, we're still in Matthew chapter three. The Bible says, then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan. Watch this. Confessing their sins. Are you seeing that in the scripture, church? That's verse 5. Drop down to verse 11. John says, now look, I indeed, don't get it twisted, I indeed baptize you with water. Here he says it, unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There are three baptisms right there in that one passage. And they're all different. He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one that's coming after me, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He, you need to know Christian, man, Christian woman, when someone says the word baptism or when you read the word baptism, which one is being referenced so that you don't get in an argument wasting your time with another Christian who wants to argue the scriptures. John says, I indeed baptize you with water. With my baptism, you're going to get wet. But with his baptism, you're going to get very hot. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm coming in hot. (laughs) Different baptisms. So Acts chapter 19, if we continue with this narrative, Paul now is starting to evangelize and go out and spread the gospel about Jesus Christ. He went to this place called Ephesus and came upon believers and says, have you received since you believe? Let's break this down now. Receive what? Paul was talking about, have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Have you received since you believe? They said, well, we haven't heard that there even be any Holy Ghost. Paul says, so then which baptism were you baptized in? Because Paul knew there was more than one. It's just today's Christian that wants to argue about their version of baptism. So Paul says, well, then which baptism was it? They said it was John's baptism. Church, don't miss this now. Because John's baptism was not unto salvation. Paul was out trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ about people getting saved. These people said, I was baptized unto John baptism. Paul said, okay, but then you just got baptized for the remission of sins. There's another baptism and another baptism and another baptism that you don't know about. Somebody say amen. Amen. Here's what we got to take away from this passage. Um, Salvation does not require any type of work. Salvation does not require any type of ceremony or ritual. Salvation does not require baptism. We are saved by God's grace through our faith. Somebody say hallelujah. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. We are saved by God's grace through our faith. Aren't you glad we are not saved by what somebody else thinks about us? Aren't you glad you're not saved by how your grandmother got saved? Aren't you glad you're not saved by... Say grace and faith. So when Jesus came to be baptized, God was at that time establishing, watch this, a new and improved covenant or arrangement using baptism. Somebody said there was a better way. Come on, say it like you mean it, a better way. Church, what was happening, um, God was shifting baptisms because we know for one fact, Without a doubt, Jesus did not get baptized for the repentance of sin 
and the remission of sins. I heard the Bible said that Jesus was sinless. Is there a witness in the house? I know you try to reduce Jesus sometimes. The Bible says that we are joint heirs with him, but I know you do realize that Jesus ain't never sinned. It ain't enough witnesses in the house that can testify that Jesus ain't never sinned. So we know that he didn't come to John to be baptized for the remission of sins. He didn't come repenting. So that lets us know that this shift was real because baptism would no longer be the way for sins to be remitted or forgiven. After Jesus came, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no more remission of sin. No more bulls and bullocks and lambs and doves, but only the blood of Jesus. That's God's plan. So hear me, church, now you got to, I don't want you to get too excited and miss the point. The reason that we should be excited and give God praise is because um, the plan was that you would have to be accountable for your own sins. Well, for those who only did one or two sins, you okay. But for the rest of us who know that that accountability for sins would mean that they would nail us in the side and put nails in our feet and put, na- anybody scared yet? So now that Jesus has come on the scene, you can't get baptized to get your sins remitted. It's only going to be the blood of Jesus. Today's believers do not get baptized for the remission of sins. The song says, what can wash away my sins? And the background says, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. The next Sunday, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. So how come the next Sunday we sing, take me to the water and baptize me like John did Jesus one day. Take me to the water and wash my sins away. Make that make sense. You just said nothing shall wash away my sins but the blood of Jesus. And you got the church jumping, shouting and exciting saying that take me to the water. Dip me like John did Jesus one day to wash my sins. Jesus' sins didn't get washed away and neither will yours. Somebody say bring the book. We got to teach this thing. You having arguments with people about baptism and both of y'all Christians. So today's believers, somebody say, thank you, Jesus. The blood will never lose its power. The blood still works. The blood reaches. It is the blood of Jesus. Please don't get it twisted. People get confused about baptism washing sins away. They are not incorrect. They are just incomplete. They're in the wrong covenant. So if you think baptism washed your sins away, you in the wrong arrangement. Look at your neighbor and say, no, there's a new arrangement. That's what we're doing now. It's a new arrangement. We are now under the new covenant. We are baptized, watch this baptism, into his body. We are baptized into the body of Christ. Do you mind? Are you still in Ephesians chapter 4? Come on, this is a teaching on this morning. Don't put your Bibles down. Ephesians 4, are you still there? Are you there? Yeah. Ephesians 4, verse 4 says, there is but one body and one spirit. It goes on to say there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. This phrase, one baptism, means it is the primary baptism. It is the baptism of all baptisms. It is the baptism into the body of Christ. This is the one baptism that we all share and experience as believers. This is the baptism uh, that we receive immediately in the spirit once we are saved. The Bible says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation put your hands together for the assurance of the word right then church we are immersed we are baptized into the body of Christ the word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo you know if you're going to do a teaching you got to add some foreign language it got to be some Greek or some Hebrew the word baptizo means to listen it means to bury 
It means to submerge. It means to overwhelm. It means to take under. It means to overtake. It's almost like you put a letter in an envelope. The whole letter is inside of the envelope. That's a baptism. So I want you to understand this. Whatever you're totally in is all over you. That's why they used to saying he's all over me and he's keeping me alive. And when that choir really got rocking, they say he's in the front, he's in the back, he's in the top, he's in the bottom, he's on the left, he's on the right. By the time you get done describing Jesus, you are baptized, you are in him. Somebody say, I'm in him. So if, if you're going to be all in something, then it has to be all over you, but you've got to be all in. Too many Christians don't want to be all in. Well, I'm sort of kind of working on some things. I'm sort of kind of committed. Uh, I, I need to get some things together. Well, Jesus said, well, listen, well, I thought I came to get you together. If you're going to get yourself together, what you need me for? If you're going to get yourself together, why did I die up on the cross? If you could have got yourself together, you would have done it by now. Somebody say, I'm in him. Jesus said, now that you're in me, he said in his word, you need to abide in him, to stay in him. I want to talk to somebody who's all in. I mean, I'm looking for all in Christians. See, I want to know who's all in. Don't worry about the offering. Don't worry about seed time. You always got reservations. Don't worry about that. Are you in the kingdom? Are you in Jesus? Many times we hear about somebody who left one church, went to another church, leave this church, go to another church. That don't faze me. I don't deal with loss management. My wife always got one question. Are they still in the kingdom? Just because you left the bedroom and went to the kitchen, are you still in the house? Just because you went from upstairs to downstairs, are you still in the house? All I know, I'm going to preach Jesus. I want you to be in him. For in him we live. In him we move. And in him we have our being. See, the pastor say, if you're going to move, you might as well don't move at all unless you move in. Anybody in Jesus? Anybody been baptized in Jesus? Anybody in him? You've been baptized into the body. Hallelujah. So church, in the New Testament, Paul came teaching using the human body as a metaphor and he used this language to make it clear to us that we are actually baptized into a body. Somebody say the body of Christ. That's your baptism right there. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Why are Christians arguing? It's like Jesus responded to the religious people that always came asking him questions. And Jesus has to answer to all questions. And sometimes he would say, have you never read? Have you never read? Master, uh, uh, can a man put away his wife in divorce? And have, you not, have you read? Master, it's April the 15th. It's time to pay your taxes. You're going to pay up? I don't know why religious people mess with Jesus and they still messing with them. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, have you never read? <laughs> All are baptized into one body. It does not matter whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you are black or white, whether you are male or female. This country got in trouble because they never read. Oh, I ain't going to bother it. I'm not, I'm not going to bother it. That's, that's too hard. That's too, it's too real. Too real too real I can't bother that this morning it does not matter whether you black or white male female Jew Gentile male female Baptist AME Church of God in Christ Pentecostal Assembly of the God Assembly of God Church of God by faith it does not matter one body one baptism anybody been baptized so when we acknowledge and admit that we've sinned, who've done that? When we repent and tell God we're sorry, who's done that? When we believe that Jesus died for our sins, who believes that? When we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, who believes that? So then when we confess with our mouth that he's Lord, that's a baptism. We have baptism at this church every Sunday. We are baptized into the body of Christ, and this is done in the spirit. Somebody say, I'm saved. 
Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm sure enough saved. Come on, look at another neighbor and say, I am saved. Because you were baptized into his body. Now you are a candidate for water baptism. Did you catch that shift? We shift from number one to number three. Actually, it should be two, but this is the second one I'm mentioning. We shift it from the baptism of repentance and the remission of sins to the baptism into the body. Now, water baptism. Then and only then are you a candidate legitimately for water baptism. I ask you again, can I teach the thing? Baptism into his body is spiritual. Baptism into water is symbolic. Don't miss that note takers. That are in the argument right there. Baptism into his body is spiritual. Baptism into his body is symbolic. Please don't miss this note takers because water baptism cannot, did not, does not, and will not save you. I think I'll say it again. Water baptism cannot, did not, does not, will not save you. So if you got water baptized to get saved like I did, if you got water baptized to get clean, cleansed for sin, I don't know what I was doing. If you got water baptized to get it right with God, it's a dead work and it won't work. What do I mean by dead work? Anything that you're doing trying to obtain righteousness from God is a dead work and it won't work. God says, I've already put my plan together for how you get close to me. It's through my son. Don't try to do any type of work to get next to me. It's a dead work and it won't work. And we got a lot of dead work going on now. You know we got to do communion on the first Sunday. Say who? Well, we must wear white for water baptism, says who? We got to do water baptism in a church, says who? So we accept some of these practices, but so that you know, I'll change it up in a minute. We'll do, we'll do communion next Sunday. I'll get Elder Bradford to go get it in here right now and do it. But, but wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't have on black. I ain't got on black either. So when you accept these practices, just make sure you realize it is symbolic so that you don't start an argument with someone and reveal how much you don't know. People are going to start asking, what church you go to? Tell Tell them. Tell them. Tell them. As long as you're not the one that started the argument. No, no, no. You I, I, Church, let me tell you this. This is uh, uh, the reason you are laughing is because some of the stuff that the church does is so comical, it makes you laugh. Some of the stuff that the church wants you to believe, I said this before, please don't think it's. You would have to leave your brain in your car to come in church to believe some of the stuff they tell you in church. You would literally have to open up your skull, take out your brain, leave it on the chair, then come to church to believe some of the stuff that they tell you in church. Somebody say, I brought my brain to church. I know you want to be spiritual, but some things you just got to think. Listen, just because you got water baptized does not mean you're saved. Listen, you don't have to have a, a wedding to be married. If you want to spend the thousands upon thousands of dollars to get married, to have a wedding, do it. But if I decide to go to the justice of the peace, I'm just as married. You do know that you don't have to be dead to have a funeral. And watch this. You don't have have to have a funeral to be dead. People die all the time and there's no funeral. It's symbolic. It's a ceremony. I promise you, whether your family buried you or not, you are still dead. You don't have to be a car to hang out in the garage. I'm telling you some of the stuff that they try to make you believe in church, you can leave your brain in the car. 
You don't physically have to eat Jesus' body and drink his blood to do communion. Come on now. So since we don't have to physically eat his body and physically drink his blood, then why do we have to have on white? Why do we have to have on black? Why must it be on the first Sunday? Why must the deacons hold their hand behind their back? Why must the plate be gold? What is it about religion? And while we are having arguments about the practice, the person who's never heard about Jesus is going walking down the street free. And we're having the discussion about protocol. It's not protocol, it's who to call. It's the... Unsaved people have never heard the gospel and you having a discourse, a dialogue, a holy bout, a whole blown boxing match. Have you never read? But if you don't have to have a wedding to be married, if you don't have to have a funeral to be dead, then you don't have to get water baptized to be saved. It is ceremonial and it is symbolic. Put your hands together for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Messed up people for life. So church, when an individual is born again through their acceptance of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are qualified to be water baptized, and we know it's not because of the remission of sins of repentance. So let me give it this way for the note takers. Water baptism is not essential, but it is sequential. It is not essential, but there's a specific order to it. And what we do is we get the sequence wrong. I stand chief among you who violated the sequence. I got baptized at 12. And I got saved at 22. You got it backwards. Yes, I did. Who's with me? I'm looking. I'm looking. Look at all these phony Christians in here. You got baptized at 9. And ain't even getting the sin right yet. You ain't even got into your good sins yet. <laughs> the good sins. <laughs> Senior pastor preached a sermon. My mama made me do it. I'm like, mm hmm, that's what you did. You made me get baptized. And you knew I wasn't saved. I knew I wasn't saved. And the preacher didn't even ask me if I wanted to get saved. <laughs> you can come by letter on your Christian experience or a candidate for baptism. I'll take the third one. <laughs> Went down in the water, a 12-year-old devil, came back up, a wet 12-year-old devil. <laughs> Picked my deacon of choice and said, look, now get off my back and let the sinning begin. <laughs> y'all don't want to talk, y'all too, y'all too religious in here. You too religious in here. That's why God can't use you. And I give God praise for my military experience that took me away from home to another place because the back of the hymn book at my church says, by covenant, I'm supposed to find another Baptist church just like this. I'm not putting down any denomination. That's the one I came from. I went to a different one in a different state on a different side of the country, and I went down the I said, wait a minute, I did this already. He said, yeah, but you ain't got saved. So I left there, went to a church that said, here's how we offer salvation. I said, oh my God, you mean to tell me getting baptized, I ain't going to bother it no more. Because I, I ain't going to bother it no more. But I know I got baptized and I know I wasn't saved. Why? Because the offering that the altar called, the offering, what, the, what was proposed was not, do you want to get saved today? So therefore, if that wasn't asked, that's what, what I answered to. Can I move on? Can I move on? Water baptism is an outward expression of what's already happened inwardly. That's all it is. It's an outward expression. We had 11 candidates yesterday who made this public declaration of a new association with Jesus. I'm with him and he's with me. It is an outward open expression of what's already happened inwardly. Romans chapter 6, this is Paul still trying to help the church out. 6, 3 through 5. Know ye not, when someone opens a scripture like that, that means you're supposed to know this. Have you never read? Don't you know 
that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, remember that's the baptism into the body, we're baptized unto his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For, verse 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. What does this mean? I'm glad you asked. It means water baptism is symbolic of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. I'm trying to prove the point. I'm not trying to say you didn't do anything important, but Jesus did all the important work. But we identify with him because the saved person who commits the water baptism is a candidate. As a candidate, they just experience a death, a submission, a sacrifice. Say, I'm dead. You go down in the water, that is an identification or reflection of the burial. Say, I was buried. You were brought up out of the water, that is uh, indicative of your resurrection. So you experience a death a burial, and a resurrection. Paul would say, I am crucified with Christ. With him. The old folks used to say, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And you're trying to count on your fingers, like A, D, B, C, 12. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? And you, the answer is yes. Don't tremble about it. Yes, you were there. Because you were there by identification. If we ever knew who we were, we would know that God wants us to identify with Jesus. God wants to see Jesus when he looks at us. Don't be confused about this thing. Someone else may need your help with this revelation because they are tormented today. They're sick and have not been baptized. And that's the only thing they worried about. Honey, that's the least of your worries. But I'm sick and I was told it was terminal and I haven't been baptized yet. People, Christians don't even know how to help someone in that predicament. How do I know it? Because I've heard a Christian ask someone who's experienced loss, um, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Was they, were they baptized? Y'all think I'm playing. So the way you want to comfort the person who's dealing with loss is to ask them, was they, were they baptized? So what if the person says no? Somebody say, I brought my brain to church but also brought some sensitivity to church. And you should know better if you don't know what to say. Don't. Sick and haven't been baptized and your greatest worry is that no one took you to the water to dip you, a symbolic, ceremonial, religious ritual. Some argue that you must be baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, I'm about to step on some toes today. They, if you don't do it in Jesus' name, you might as well pack your bags because you're going to hell. Some argue you must be submerged. Others argue that you can be sprinkled on top of the head. Some argue that you must be baptized in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Ghost. But guess what Pastor Terrence did, okay? And I only did it because I know how folks can be in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and in Jesus' name. Look at your, look at your neighbor and say, Pastor, them fell for it too. Oh, I'm okay. Look, look at your neighbor and say, he done fell for it too. He's trying to appease somebody who would argue. Well, I did it according to the book that says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, that's the end of the scripture. So why you jump all the way over the Acts? You left Matthew and say, oh yeah, in Jesus' name. I want you to be comfortable that you have a legitimate baptism. Is it okay to be baptized in the name of the Father? See? In the name of the Son, whose name is Jesus. So some argue that you must be submerged. Some argue you can be sprinkled. Some say it must be in the name of Jesus. Some say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some say whatever they got to say. And it is doing what religion does, which is what? Confuse people. What about a paralyzed man who cannot get taken to the water to be baptized? Is he condemned to hell? 
Go get your brain. Go, go get it. Go get your brain. What about the person who just got in a car accident and they decided to confess their sins and say, God, if you're real, I believe you. I believe that you died for my sins. I live the sinless life. I'm sorry. I confess you with my mouth. What if they don't get baptized? They can't go to heaven. Well, no, because I was saved all my life and they just did it at the last minute. Go get your brain. Go get your brain. You not helping people. A person's paralyzed, a person's sick, they never got baptized. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was hanging on the cross in between two thieves. One of them, whoo, Lord have mercy, one of them tried to mock Jesus. And the other one rebuked him and said, are you crazy? Don't worry about him. We all in the same predicament. He said, I believe who you are. Can you just remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus said, don't worry about it, bro. You're going to be with me today in paradise. Wait, 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 Jesus. Wait, Jesus. He ain't been water baptized yet. You're going to tell Jesus that he, who are you to, re, <laughs> who, who do you think you are that you can forgive sins? Who do you think you are that you can heal people's body? You know the religious people told Jesus that. So here he is in the final hour telling the man who was a thief. Now that does not mean he stole one time. Look at your neighbor and say, I only did it once. So I'm not categorically a liar. I don't need it once. So I know this man stole more than once because they called him a thief. And Jesus said, don't worry, bro. Today you will be with me in paradise. I don't worry. I, I trump the baptism, all of the religion. You come into glory with me. Somebody give God praise. One baptism. He got baptized on the cross. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear did you hear what I just said? That man, thank you, Holy Ghost. That man got baptized on the cross. He was baptized into the body because he told Jesus, I believe who you are. And just remember me when you go into your kingdom. Bam, God said, that did it. So church, this is evidence that water baptism is not required nor essential to be with God in heaven. His grace is the thing that is sufficient for us all. And church, that's why we implemented the simplicity of the ABCs at this church, not to water down salvation or not make it like a big, exciting thing, but we want to counter the religious movement that makes salvation about everything else except the blood of Jesus. You're concerned about how long somebody dresses is, but not the blood of Jesus. You're concerned about who they live with, but not the blood of Jesus. You're concerned about their practices, but not the blood of Jesus. You're concerned about whether they wear the little, I don't even know what it's called, the little thing on the head, but not the blood of Jesus. You're concerned about what name they were baptized in, but not the blood of Jesus. You're concerned about whether it was water or a sprinkle, but not the blood of Jesus. So we said, let's just make it simple. A, B, C. Acknowledge, admit, believe, confess. And that would make somebody think, I mean, I, would, I, would, I was expected to have my head down for a long time because all the wrong I did. No, God already forgave you for all of that. And guess what? Keep, hold your head up. The sins that you haven't even committed yet, God said, I already took care of that too. I believe the Christians in the house need to give God praise. I mean, it's good enough to, for, to forgive me of all the sins I've committed. But you mean to tell me you've already forgiven me for the sins that I haven't even... Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Well, that's it. A, B, C. And for whatever reason, religion and the church keeps adding requirements and layers and requirements and layers. I got a message. The body of Christ is not a fraternity. It's not a special club or sorority. Stop trying to haze and initiate people into the body. It's not a fraternity. Well, he got to do it how I did it in the 70s. I don't want none of what you did in the 70s. Everybody got to go through what I went through. Why? You went through unnecessary stuff. 
It is not a secret society where you got to initiate people to put them through what you've been through. They probably didn't sin the way you sin anyway. So church, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of your way. I'm not saying, nor am I suggesting that you should not get baptized. Water. Nor am I trying to reduce its importance. I'm just trying to say anything that you do outside of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a dead work and it will not work for you. If you're saved, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take on the ministry of identification. Look at your neighbor and say identification. Come on, somebody. When you get in trouble, the authorities want to get your ID and tell me who you are. Can you identify yourself? If you take on the ministry of identification, that means you know who you are. So not only was Jesus crucified, somebody say, I was crucified too. Not only did Jesus die, somebody say, I died too. Not only was Jesus buried, say, I was buried too. Not only was Jesus quickened while in the grave, say, I was quickened while I was under the water. Come on, not only was Jesus quickened, he was also made alive, say, I was made alive too. Not only was Jesus raised, say, I was raised too. And bless God, we are seated together in heavenly places. Come on, say, I got my ID. I know who I am. I know which baptism I'm in. I'm baptized in the body, the body of Christ. Hey, thank you so much for watching this sermon. I really appreciate you being a part of our service on today. But listen, you don't have to stop there. Subscribe to this channel so you can know when we upload content or when we go live. Also, you can come and join us live at Victory Church at any time. Meet us at 11 a.m. right here at The V. And finally, please share this sermon with a friend. That way you help us spread the gospel to a dying world. Thanks again for watching and God bless you.